Yeah, yeah. Vancouver is one hour behind us, so they are four thirty right now. Okay, nice to see all of you, Doctor Suranjit from uh, from uh, Peri uh, Peridini University. Is that right? Sorry. And Doctor uh, Zulfi, you're from Utah. Is that right? Can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, we can. Yes, sir, yes, sir. we can. We can, sir. Go ahead. I got worried. All right, uh, shall we shall we can start, start. Sir, the YouTube the YouTube link is on. Okay. Uh, um, very good morning to our friends, colleagues uh, from in USA um, and also in Brazil. Good afternoon to the UK folk and to Germany and to, and then to East Africa in the afternoon, East Africa and uh, uh, Israel, and then we go on to my friends in India, and then UK, um, yeah, Hong Kong and Malaysia, right? And then of course, we from Australia are here. So very good, good day to all of you. Um, I welcome all of you to the, the uh, second session of the webinar 24, uh, that is focused on ethical issues faced by the physiotherapists globally in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. For those of you who were not here for the first one, I'll just repeat that uh, uh, I am Professor Russell D'Souza from uh, the head of chair and head of the education um, uh, program of the UNESCO chair in bioethics. I'm based in Melbourne, Australia, and uh, this program uh, that, as you know, has been going on since April this year, under what we call the series under the WIC, uh, Medical Ethics and the WIC of, of COVID. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, can I ask a request everyone to keep your mics off, please? Okay, and so the UNESCO chain in bioethics has over 250 centers uh, in 58 countries across all the six continents. So we will have our colleagues from all, all the centers taking part in this. And so we have been uh, uh, looking at the, the series has been going from April, and we've covered many, all the areas from from uh, medicine, uh, uh, medical to to um, family therapy, psychiatry, and we recently had dental and then nursing, and of course uh, we are delighted uh, to see uh, the physiotherapists. We know, uh, but we are we are working in unusual times. And we know that physiotherapists are still uh, assessing and treating patients, and of course, do, uh, informed by the best available evidence, doing this under uh, a different set of conditions now with the COVID, in altered working environments, and in uh, with new teams, and with with the current bandwidth of healthcare stretched to capacity with the pandemic. But uh, uh, you'll be drawing on existing resources and uh, and decades of research that's highly applicable to clinical practice. The what what the physiotherapists are doing, allied health professionals, which clear in clear which physiotherapists are, are contributing uh, uh, immensely in critical care. COVID nineteen patients present with acute respiratory distress syndrome for which medical management role of phys physiotherapy, rehabilitation uh, and interventions have become um, standard. And the physiotherapy bioethics program of the UNESCO chair in bioethics is presenting this uh, webinar series 
as we have with with the various other allied health and uh, uh, other health participant to mera hai na focus hmm. on on the hum hai participant hmm. so we today we continue we did have some of the areas that we we covered and today we going, we are going to continue with um further areas that, uh, that will interest all of you will learn and one of the important things that uh, article 13 of the universal declaration on bioethics and human rights is around solidarity and cooperation and indeed the unesco chair uh, is supporting and demonstrating this solidarity and today we have <clears throat> all of you from various parts across this globe but all uh, dealing with the covid together is a sign of solidarity that we take we take this uh, we we together in this world are facing this uh, pandemic and will come out of it too um, all our webinars as you know will always stretch to have all regions of the world covered uh, in this so we come out as in solidarity so today i'm going to reintroduce um, all of the all our participants have been there and just for those of you who are who are new um, i'm going to introduce <coughs> our panel a distinguished international panel of uh, from the allied health physiotherapy uh, uh, specialists here we have uh, tanya gilmo i start to tanya because she is uh, from uh, a senior physiotherapist with melbourne health one of the big health um, major hospital and health network in melbourne australia so she joins us today from australia and then we have um, uh, dr naomi uh, from the head of physiotherapy uh, and orthopedics and rehabilitation at the moi university in kenya and i'm delighted to now also introduce dr viru raghav parmal who is the certified manual he yeah, is a physiotherapist at the university of alberta uh, in the hospital at uh, at uh, edmonton i think and uh, well, uh, dr walid um, kamal has dr walid kamal come in yes, yes. Walid, welcome dr walid i didn't see you earlier Uh, Dr. Walid is a, 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 a associate professor of physiotherapy in the in Cairo University in Egypt. He joins us from there, and then we have Dr. Uh, Dr. Saud uh, Subali, who is the vice dean of the Department of uh, Physiotherapy and Health Rehabilitation at the Prince Saddam bin uh, Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia. who will also be a part of um panel yesterday dr um surangika is uh, the senior lecturer in the department of physiotherapy uh, faculty of allied health sciences at the university of peridunia in sri lanka and uh, welcome uh, dr surang surangika and then we have uh, yes Uh, so this way everyone gets to show you a good way uh, and then dr dr maria jindani who is the associate professor of of physiotherapy of physiotherapy at the kem hospital in mumbai in india yeah and i'll introduce you to john where is john john yes put your hand up john john stevens um, who was there uh, last week joined us again he is a senior lecturer in physiotherapy at the university of sunderland in united kingdom uh, and finally i have uh, i'm really delighted to introduce mohammed no zul uh, zul bin uh, mohammed from malaysia from ut Uh, Dr. Rafi, I think you've just, just muted yeah. yourself. 
just unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, no. Oh, once more. Yes. Who unmuted me? I don't know who unmuted me. Who no, muted me? Yeah. I didn't see it. So all what I said, did you not hear it? No, no, only the last last word. Last word went. It, the rest was okay. fine. Okay, the, 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 my Dr. Moment, uh, you're from Utah University, is that right? Right, and Utah has a has a UNESCO center there, which is under my my area. With uh, Professor Deva is the head from psychiatry is the head of that unit. Okay, you know you know him? No, no, I didn't. So we were there. I was there for the inauguration not long ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So all of you are here now. It's important that uh, uh, so these are the panelists. We have got the convener, and I want to, uh, for those who are not here, I want to introduce Dr. Neelam Mishra. Dr. Neelam Mishra is the vice chancellor of uh, the Krishna University, but importantly, she is the head of the Allied Health Biotics Program of the UNESCO chair, and so she convenes this, um, this webinar today. And we have Dr. Pooshna Devi, who is the Dean Academics for Physiotherapy at the University Krishna University, who is the head of the uh, Physiotherapy Biotics Program. So both of them are convening uh, uh, of the of the webinar. So we got and Dr. Derek Colonel Derek um, Colonel Professor Derek D'Souza. You would have met him. He's one of the um, two quad uh, moderators, Rosalie Mary Matthew and Derek Davis, Professor Mary Matthew. Today, Derek, Professor Derek is going to be the moderator um, uh, who will take you through uh, the, the next 120 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to uh, the Vice Chancellor, Dr. Nina Mishra, for a few words. To set the scene and then Professor Purvish Nadevi will also say a few words before we go on to the program. Welcome, all of you. Yes, ma'am, you're unmuted. We can hear you. Go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, please go yes, ahead. Please. Thank you, Dr. Russell, sir. And good afternoon, everybody present over here. Good morning, good afternoon. I got to so well time, it is there. Good, uh, welcome, all of you. Respected Dr. Russell D'Souza, sir, the pioneer of biotech program in India. Am I, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Yes, Dr. Russell, sir, in India, there is missionary zeal for biotechs. Respected Dr. Derek D'Souza, Dr. Poo Vishnu Devi, learned resource persons, participating delegates, friends, ladies, and gentlemen. I deem it my great pleasure in extending a very warm welcome to esteemed dignitaries and all of you in my official capacity as National Head of Biotics Program in India for Allied Health Sciences, who to this notable webinar in all important theme titled ethical issues faced by physiotherapists globally in responding to COVID-19 pandemic. This COVID-19 pandemic has jolted all the world in every aspect, all the work they have, as you can see there, so much problem is there. So, this nature of dealing that is required to set account has brought into four various things to bring into account. So it is equally true yes. that entire for the by the healthcare team, they have to face several ethical problems, maybe in the form of experimental researches in for vaccine, for or maybe for protective equipment, or maybe for the consideration of public health, and it may be for aspects we can say the preventive, the curative, and the rehabilitative domains of the healthcare profession, healthcare professional for the operational reality. The inequity in the resources, paucity, scarcity, there is is yet another dimension which has baffled the entire man and mankind. So so many things are there that are just not up to the mark. So social and economic impact this is also one thing. So in this context, the entire functioning of the healthcare team, including personnel from allied health sciences in category of nursing staff, paramedical workers, physiotherapists, also need to be redefined in a real sense of strategic modalities. It is to be involved for the mitigation of ethical challenges that are raising their head at every step. 
it out of this realization rightly it was thought appropriate by department of education unesco chair bharti haipa under the stewardship of dr rasel disuja sir in company of all eminent allied well meaning experts to invoke various thematic topics for deliberations discussions through series of webinar to bring into focus the various problems that have arisen and also the strategic modality for mitigation of the same in the interest of men and mankind so in this for the continuation of the same the set series that the theme undertaken for the today is timely apt relevant and i am sure by way of the deli learned deliberations today by the learned resource persons will bring into force focus various changes that the covid pandemic management has raised before the physiotherapist as a part of healthcare team and a way ahead for ensuring they are appropriately tackled i record my thankfulness and gratitude to all the learned resource persons and profound sense of thankfulness for dr professor rasel disuja sir and i have great pleasure in welcoming all of you to this elite sem webinar thank you and and all Now I hand over to Dr. Disuja, Director Disuja, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nilam, thank you very much. Yes, uh, I have, we have a large uh, of all of you to know. Dr. Nilam says yes, we have a, a, a very large uh, program in India, but of course I look up. I have uh, we have a unit in uh, in uh, University of Kerala, which in fact I'm there. we have a program next week uh, in in university of kerala in kalambo in utah and cyberjay in malaysia so i have we have all these uh, the places that we are working with thank you so much for that and now i'll ask uh, vishnu uh, uh, dr professor dr vishnu devi to uh, say a few words about her with she's the uh, dean for physical team thank you sir Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I am Dr. T. Pooshna Devi, Dean Academics, Physiotherapy, Kims University, India, and Head of Physiotherapy Biotics Program of the UNESCO Chair in Biotics. I am delighted to co-convene this recurrent international panel discussion of the Education Department of UNESCO Chair in Biotics as a continuation of last week's webinar on ethical issues faced by physiotherapists during the COVID-19 pandemic. we had a good number of participants that is 420 participants in zoom and around 120 participants on live streaming in youtube and excellent discussion by the distinguished panel of physiotherapists from all the continents on their encounters during covid-19 pandemic in their country in the pandemic physiotherapists under the allied health banner have and continue to play an important role from critical care to tele rehabilitation as clinicians adapt to transformation in physiotherapy education to enable the profession to overcome the new way of learning and teaching as academicians policies adopted by the government for the physiotherapist working in covid wards and in community settings in the wake of covid-19 pandemic i am delighted that the unesco chair decided to give an opportunity to for all the participants to learn and enlighten on physiotherapist role and the problems faced in telephysiotherapy teaching learning methods adapted in various countries and government initiatives towards the betterment of physiotherapist it's a great opportunity to everyone know to know and inculcate the best ethical practice in both academic and clinical areas during the covid-19 pandemic in the various roles across the regions globally thank you everyone thank you dr vishnu and now uh, yes dr rasel Yeah, thank you, uh, Vishnu. Uh, uh, now I'm going to hand you to David Pandey uh, Desuza, who uh, will conduct the uh, moderation, and I'll check. I'll do his job of uh, checking the, uh, the the chat. Uh, chat that may yeah. come later. So he wasn't speaking too well, and so he tried to join us later. I think. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, distinguished panel. And uh, without further ado, because I know we have a lot to discuss today, and uh, like Dr. Russell said, we welcome 
Tanya from Melbourne, Australia, and we'll give her as the opening batsman. So uh, Tanya, welcome. Uh, you can unmute yourself, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, we'd like to know what is the current situation in Australia as far as uh, the status of physiotherapists goes, how uh, are they able to practice, what are the present uh, restrictions on them? And if you can just tell us in a short way of, uh, what about the education? How, how has it affected the physiotherapy students? Yeah, all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I work at Myash Health, which is the largest um, hospital network in Victoria. Um, I can speak on behalf of Victoria, the state that I live in, Melbourne. We're quite different to the rest of Australia because unfortunately the COVID um, pandemic hit us the hardest. Our second wave has, um, as you might have heard through, through the media, um, our restrictions are one of the strictest in the world. So we have, we're currently in stage four restrictions, which means in our hospital network, we can't have any visitors at all unless patients are palliative. If patients are palliative, we have quite strict um, visiting schedules where families can visit for only two hours in the day. In terms of physiotherapists, since the second wave, I mean, it's changing on a weekly basis with um, how strict our, our practices are within the hospital. Our PPE has changed from March to today. In various parts of the hospital, like the emergency department, um, our PPE has been changing on almost on a, a weekly basis with what we have to go through in the protocols. Only last week they introduced a, the hospital introduced, or the whole network, the Monash um, network introduced a system where we need to log on before we come to the hospital um, and answer a few questions on an admittance that we are not sick and that we have, haven't have um, come in contact with COVID and that we haven't been overseas in the past fortnight. So every week we've got changes happening um, to our workplace. In terms of physiotherapists and, and, and allied health in general, we now work in what we call bubbles. And that is so that if a physiotherapist does get sick with COVID, it doesn't take down an entire team of physiotherapists. So, for example, if you work, if you're a senior physiotherapist in the respiratory unit, if you become sick with COVID, that then means your entire team is furloughed. By furloughed, it means you have to stay home for a fortnight, go through at least two COVID tests that are negative okay. before you can come back to work. And so we have bubbles where our, our physiotherapists are working in a multidisciplinary um, team in order to preserve our, our staff to continue to work and stay at work. Um, these are some of the restrictions that we've got at the moment. It is very different to the rest of the state because the rest of the state aren't, haven't got the restrictions that Melbourne have at the moment. Our students, we do still have students coming in to do their practical um, sessions in the hospital. They're few and far between. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, we're trying to reduce the footprint of allied health, of staff members on the ward. So we do have students in various capacities, but it is limited at the moment. Thank our you. students Thank our you. students are actually working online. They're not allowed at universities. So those who aren't um, doing practicals, they are working online through WebEx and classes, various. Uh, we do have classes, classes going on. yes, right, and they're right. all digital. Okay. okay. Uh, what about the uh, private practitioners or those who are not really connected with the hospital? Sure. Uh, how has, have they been affected? So again, it's very different in Melbourne because our restrictions are such that we can only see patients if it's for an emergency case. The, our governing body, VAPRA, have highlighted for any allied health, whether you're a physiotherapist or an optometrist or a dentist, you're only seeing patients who are considered urgent with urgent needs. That is up to the individual okay. practitioner to decide whether their patient has urgent needs. The way that it's been um, perceived in the general physiotherapist um, community is 
if we can provide the assistance to a patient to prevent an admission to the emergency department or to the hospital, then that is considered an emergency. Right, right. Okay, thank you. I think that was uh, very well uh, summarized and I think you gave us a beautiful overview of uh, everything uh, that is happening there. Uh, I'll move to Professor Stevens now. And uh, Dr. Stevens, uh, last time I remember you were mentioning about how uh, remote uh, physiotherapy or the remote solutions, because like Tanya told us, uh, there are restrictions until something is really classified as an emergency. Uh, neither does anybody really want to come to the healthcare system and even those restrictions. So the only alternative is to go via remote or uh, telephysiotherapy, if you want to use that word. So what is the current status? And if you can give us a short overview of uh, that in the UK. Okay, thank you very much. And great to see everyone uh, once again. Um, I think technology, if we look at that overall, um, really has been accelerated across um, COVID. Um, it's been a sort of feature of COVID, both in practice and also um, in education. Again, with today's focus being around education and policy and technology. Um, and I think if I pick up on points that Tanya made previously, a great feature of what's gone on is the rate of change. So it's about acceleration, um, but also the degree of uncertainty. And similar to Australia within the UK, um, obviously we're looking at a lot smaller landmass, but at the moment, although there are, is national policy, the way that that's being implemented at different areas of the UK, different countries that make up the UK, but also different areas um, within um, each country. So for example, at the moment, um, although we're not back on lockdown, um, where I live in the northeast of England, um, we're on a watch list at the moment because the, the instance rate is, is creeping up again in the area. And if we think about practice and education, technology drives everything. Probably one of the biggest changes to education um, in the last century was the invention of the motor car because people could travel you know, to different establishments and <laughs> much more mobile. And I think now when we look at mobile technology and particularly I suppose smartphones and smart technology um, has been a feature of our lives, all our lives since about 2007 now. Um, and that's been coming into education and been coming into practice um, over the past um, 10 years or more. But I think this past six months has seen a massive acceleration in terms of um, how technology is being used. So for example, um, within education, um, we're similar to Tanya in that our students are due to return um, to start the new academic year this coming week and all our lectures for the program that I work on and it's quite a similar approach across the UK. Um, the key words here are really risk assessment um, and technology. Um, all of our lectures will be delivered online um, using various platforms. Um, we use uh, an electronic learning platform called Canvas within our university. Um, other, other sort of bits of software, things like Blackboard I know are quite commonly used in other, other universities. Um, so all our lectures are gonna be delivered online. Our practicals um, will be delivered on site. And in terms of students returning to campus, there's been an awful lot of work going on over the weekend, uh, over the, not the weekend, this summer actually, um, the past months right. in preparing campus for return of students. And this does raise um, a lot of ethical issues around uh, mental health and well-being of staff and of students um, because we're looking at provision of appropriate PPE for practical teaching um, the layout of the campus in terms of how many people can be on campus at any one time, which will you know, include staff as well. So, for example, the office that I work in um, has six people in it usually, um, but 
we're only actually going to be on campus uh, two to three days a week so that the the, the campus will be um, half capacity or the, the office will be half capacity yeah, um, within that. In terms of other ethical issues, obviously the impact in terms of actual provision. Um, a lot of the students, I've had conversations with our new students that are due to start in year one of our program um, during the last week about their technology uh, in terms of where they live, what the broadband coverage is like, um, the equipment that they have access to, so that if necessary, um, you know, the student uh, can perhaps gain support from the university. Again, there are facilities that are going to be accessible on campus within the library, for example. Um, but this, um, you know, again, there are capacity issues around that. So I'd say the ethical issues are, are wide and broad um, in terms of um, the accessibility of people to, to equipment. And that is of some concern, obviously, when we get back into teaching. Um, and although the people that I've spoken to so far, um, everything seems fine um, and everything's to work, but I, I do expect some, some glitches. In terms of policy around this, um, hopefully some of the links, I've forwarded some links, which will hopefully be um, made available to people. Um, yes, we'll be. Uh, uploading them. Uh, yeah. Soon. Oh, fantastic. I mean, that feature of change um, has resulted, and I think, again, Tanya hinted at this, a sort of plethora of really <laughs> this continual stream of policy and changing policy um, that comes out. And I think human beings, we like certainty <laughs> and the uncertainty and lots of information, um, again, is not yeah, good for people. <laughs> Not good. Not, not good for people's well-being at all. Um, and I have to say um, that our professional body in the UK, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy, um, one of the links is for their site where they've actually collated a lot of policy and also published some of their own policy on there to give both clinicians and universities, um, assistant physiotherapists and so on, a lot more help and centralized information and uh, for me that's been extremely valuable um, so there's been guidance provided for clinicians around employment about private practice which I know you mentioned to Tanya um, and also students and universities um, and also sections around well-being uh, mental health and well-being but also something which I, I thought would come up last week with, around equity and diversity, um, because COVID has actually coexisted at the, uh, the same time, um, coexisted with the Black Lives Matter movement, which has yeah. kind of gone across the States, the UK and Europe. Cool. Um, and I, I also believe in, in Australia. Um, and the black and minority ethnic groups in the UK, some statistics produced by the King's Fund, um, which is a charitable organization, independent organization in the UK, that, um, that their focus is to develop research and information to um, improve health and care. Um, during the peak of COVID in the spring, so across April, um, they produced some statistics that within the UK there's 14 percent of the population is made up of black and minority ethnic groups um, but it that, that group of people um, accounted for 34 percent of critically ill patients um, at that point there had been 119 NHS staff national health service staff mm -hmm. that were known to have died yeah. um, as a result of COVID or with influence of COVID but 64% of those were from um, ethnic minority backgrounds. And although right. there's ongoing research around that, um, but although there's already some of the sort of findings have indicated perhaps a, a higher instance of comorbidities within that particular group, there are actually socioeconomic factors that are involved with that um, in terms of, of housing yeah. and so on, yeah. and in terms of, of um, in terms of employment. Um, other groups that have been really valuable, I know sort of links I've sent through the Association of Chartered Physiotherapists and Respiratory Care. Um, 
they've also produced a lot of really valuable information, um, again, to give guidance for physiotherapists in areas such as critical care, working on call, um, and also the Council of Deans of Health, which is the national, um, national body, if you like, um, of a group of people that um, represent faculties engaged in education and research for nursing, midwifery and allied health, which obviously also includes physiotherapy. Um, and again, I think that in turn has come back or brings us back to the um, issue around education. And again, similar thing with students and staff that Tanya raised about the requirement to isolate if people have been in contact with COVID or again through track and trace have been involved in people with people who yeah. have subsequently tested positive that they then need to go um, and gain a positive uh, gain a test um, and again self-isolate and again the the public general public the period of that is now 10 days in the UK um, that was some a change that came out on the 3rd of September um, and we've had an I contact over the weekend from a student who's due to start in year two of our BSc program um, who plays he's a goalkeeper for a local football team <laughs> they'd restarted their league um, and he's just heard this week that one of the opposition players has subsequently tested positive for COVID yeah, and so yeah. um, it looks as though he's going to have to self-isolate and will miss mm -hmm. the first couple of weeks um, of, of the new term so um, you know a kind of personal story around that and I think probably that's where we are in in the UK the the and certainly the work we've been doing at Sunderland in preparing the campus for the return of students placements at the moment look fine um, our students go on placement in mm. the new year um, mm -hmm. But again, all staff have been risk assessed. I had to complete an online course and also fill in a risk assessment form um, yeah. to say that I was willing to come back to work. And because again, ethically, um, there may be students and staff who do not feel um, yeah, that they would like yeah. to come Yeah, with that. Um, and so students mm -hmm. as well, at the moment, collating returns of risk assessments from students, again, where there is a scoring system and if they score over a threshold then deemed as high risk then you know we, we've got to think again about um, how how they may access um, placement learning um, and although I know all universities in the UK uh, again through the professional body the, the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy um, have approved changes to their curriculum but also <coughs> changes to assessment because again, um, a lot of our um, assessments are practically driven, um, which again um, is a lot more difficult to do. And so people sort of change their assessments. I know some people were able to do um, equivalent assessments online um, or through media and film skills and so on and assess it in that way. So uh, sorry to, to interrupt you, but uh, you mentioned about the risk assessment and getting the assent or consent uh, from the people who <clears throat> wanted to come back to work. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Does that mean someone, a faculty or a senior physiotherapist has the choice to refuse if uh, he or she does not wish to come into work? How does in, it? In or terms is of it our... the, yeah, in terms of our university, um, then there is that quite the question is asked, uh, you know, obviously, in terms of confidentiality, I don't know what the picture is across our faculty. Um, I know that everybody on my team um, is, is willing to come back. But that is a, a question, uh, you know, there is an issue around people give being giving choice. Uh, and again, ethically, I think that's very sound you know it's not just about giving people autonomy but about um, an ability to create autonomy or create the situation where people are in a position to um, to to have a choice um, and as I say um, outside of my own team um, I'm not really I'm not really sure what's going on and probably wouldn't wouldn't find out around that um, but I know I think all 
certainly I expect this will be reflected with um, other members of the panel. You know, physiotherapy students are generally highly motivated individuals. And I know across the summer, um, there were students in the UK that were involved in voluntary work. Um, you know, although they weren't able to go on placement, um, they did sign up to go in and, and fill voluntary positions in terms of helping. Um, and some of them, um, <clears throat> some of that work involved direct patient contact as well um, from, from uh, uh, communications I've had with students. Okay. I think you're on well, mute, thank, Derek. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. That was really, really wonderful. And you, you uh, covered a lot of ground uh, as usual and gave us a very comprehensive uh, overview. Uh, I'll come to uh, Dr. Mohammed now in uh, Malaysia. I won't make you wait like we did Give last time. Uh, yeah. You are one of the younger lot, if I may say so who are here, and I think you'll be able to identify with especially maybe the postgraduate students or those who are doing the advanced uh, level of uh, physiotherapy, because again, uh, that would be a very hands-on uh, part of training, the practicals, the uh, directly associating with the patients, getting close to the patients, uh, you know, physically touching them. And this whole COVID pandemic has, uh, thrown that complete equation in a different way. Uh, how are you all approaching that? And, and what about the education of the students? What about their future? Because they're losing valuable time. Yes, maybe their digital classrooms are there. Maybe the assessment will carry on. But this practical training aspect will possibly leave a huge chunk in their overall training, their overall exposure, their confidence levels maybe. So what in your experience you feel can be done about this as, as a whole? All right, thank you very much for the question, Dr. Derek. All right, um, uh, my name is Mohamed No. I'm from uh, University of Tengku Abdul Rahman from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. All right, um, uh, answering your first question, all right. Uh, however, we don't have a postgraduate program in our uh, university currently. Right, so that's not a major uh, issue for us. Okay, however, for undergraduate, all right, um, now the policy is only uh, the, the first year and the final year students are allowed to be in on campus. All right? Okay. Because I think they, uh, they believe that this first and the uh, final student needs more um, uh, guidance <laughs> compared to the uh, third and uh, the yeah. second year student. All right. Uh, However, this student only can take the uh, practical session, not the theory. The theory part is being okay. done online. Online, right? right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, still online. Okay. And uh, for, however, for posting, the major concern is in uh, for uh, clinical attachment for the final year student. Right. Uh, no students are allowed to do the, uh, their clinical posting hospital currently. Right. right, so they have a, a, a option to defer their uh, studies for at least uh, uh, half a year. Right. They will okay. come back to hospital when the hospitals uh, uh, approve their uh, 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 approve uh, to accept approve the student. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, currently the Ministry of uh, uh, Health already allowed the students to go back to the uh, hospitals to do their clinical training. Right? Yeah. However, it subjected to the uh, uh, hospital director approval. Mm. Right? And uh, uh, I think I can say 99% hospital director didn't approve the uh, student clinical placement for physiotherapy. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. And uh, we have to find a, another alternative for them. So we are sending them to centers instead of hospitals. Either it's a government hospital or private hospitals. Uh, they are not allowed. Therefore, we are stand, sending them to uh, centers. Right. But overall, uh, the number uh, of patients would also be reduced, if I'm not wrong, in the hospital. Yes, the definitely, definitely. Emergency the, and cases which require hospitalization would be there. So that is also, again, you know, loss of uh, clinical material because Again, some of yes, the physiotherapy correct. patients mm -hmm. may not be into that uh, category of, uh, you know, emergency or yeah. 
be actually admitted in the hospital or need admission yeah. and they would be sent home as a precaution. Yeah. So, Yeah, uh, just an overview. We have uh, three uh, different types of hospitals in uh, uh, during this pandemic. They classified it as um, uh, COVID hospital, hybrid hospital, as well as non-COVID hospitals. So uh, uh, medical students, they are allowed to go to the uh, non-COVID hospitals. They are not allowed okay. to go to Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. that's 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 better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Mohammed, for for giving no us uh, yeah. that that uh, information. I'll move to uh, Sri Lanka now. And uh, Dr. Surangika, uh, again, what is the current uh, situation? Just if you can give us an update, because like all of us know, things are changing almost overnight. New uh, legislations are in place. So what is the overall situation as regards uh, physiotherapy? And again, the same uh, query about how telephysiotherapy is being used and the address of uh, the problems of education of the students from the students' point of view, because for them, they are paying for the education. For them, time is of essence. For us as faculty, okay, it's a little bit of a delay in everything we're trying to do. But for the students, this time is not going to come back. So. How is your university addressing these issues and what are their plans uh, for the future? Yes, madam, please. Currently, the I mean, since we have not uh, found uh, any question from the community level, so the uh, since May, the Sri Lanka started uh, reopening all the, um, I mean, the universities and even the schools uh, from, um, like about the first week of September. So now like uh, we are back to usual classes and um, I mean, even the classes and uh, examinations. So uh, like ad adhering to many health, uh, I mean the respiratory articles and many health uh, measures given by the Ministry of Education and Ministry of uh, Health in Sri Lanka. Um, so, uh, like for the students, I, I mean, since I'm involved in the academic field, so I'll uh, first start with the um, student education. So, uh, during the lockdown time, uh, like uh, we have uh, closed the schools and universities uh, by 14th right. March. So, mm -hmm. then uh, we had a lot of discussions with our deans of the faculties and uh, started online teaching by mid of April. Uh, and also our higher education ministry introduced a learning management system called LMS. Right. And um, they have made free access to the teachers and the students of the universities. Mm -hmm. So we have conducted like most of the theory classes via LMS program. And uh, right. yes, like as everyone said, it was a big issue for teaching hands-on skills. So what yeah. we have done was like we prepared video clips of certain exercises and practical skills and uploaded and uh, for the students who were doing clinicals at the time of close down uh, we have arranged case presentations and discussion forums so that they won't forget what they have like uh, what they were doing um, at the time of closing down uh, the students clinical postings also has stopped from 14 march but now like uh, the last week sorry the early uh, August, uh, like they have given the access again, uh, especially to uh, conduct clinical examinations for the final year students. Um, so, like, uh, and also we have ensured them uh, that the procedures that they had difficulties in understanding uh, in online teaching will be done after opening of the university. So now we are doing. Uh, those things, whatever they have not understood, uh, we are making, I mean, keeping discussions and uh, again uh, doing the, I mean, not everything, but many of the things that they come, I mean, they claim we, I mean, we are doing it. Um, so uh, the, in the universities, like, um, they have mainly the uh, how uh, our higher education ministry have asked uh, us to um, like uh, complete all the examinations uh, for the final year students uh, once we yeah. open the universities. 
uh, because most of the universities uh, were about to start I mean, the final year, the, like examinations for all the years uh, by the time of this um, closing down happened. So, so all were like about to start examinations. So our uh, higher education ministry asked to, I mean, complete the discussions and um, or complete their doubts and uh, directly go with the examinations. So we could conduct in my university, we could conduct clinical examinations for the final year students uh, by um, early week, of, by early August. So we have conducted their uh, examinations and also like we were asked to take one batch of students at a time uh, to, okay. because of the uh, problems in the, I mean, spaces and also the hostel facilities because mm -hmm. uh, like we could only take half of the uh, students. Uh, like for example, if a uh, hall can um, accommodate 50 students before now we had would have to take about 25 students. So likewise, like we had to take one batch of students at a time. Um, so, and also like uh, before getting them into the uh, university, we have distributed uh, uh, a Google form, uh, like sort of doing a uh, assessment of uh, exposure to COVID-19 patients or whether they have like, um, like whether they have traveled, I mean, what are the districts that they have traveled in the past 21 days and like whether they had direct contact with the person who came from abroad because nowadays in Sri Lanka, we don't find any case from the community level, but whoever is coming from abroad because our airports have opened. So uh, yeah. mainly the Sri Lankans uh, working abroad who are like stuck there due to travel restrictions yeah. are coming back. So. Like nowadays, the patients are coming from uh, them. So, and but of course, oh, they oh. are like in a compulsory uh, quarantine period. So, so we uh, have asked so those sort of questions. And after assessing right. their uh, Google Forms, we let them into the mm -hmm. universities. And also, at the first day, we have given an orientation program by the health center of each university to make the students aware the way that they should behave uh, in the university during this uh, pandemic situation. Um, yeah. So, and also we kept like one meter distance in the classroom sitting, uh, then um, allowing only half of the students per classroom or a laboratory and uh, advice on dress code of the lecturers and students because as yeah. like in India, the lecturers uh, are wearing saris like mostly so mm -hmm. yeah. we got guidelines like not to wear those like complicated type of uh, dressing <laughs> so yeah. because the contamination can Is happen more, so yeah. Yeah. yeah even for the students like very light simple clothing and um, okay so currently the clinical posting ac academic activities are running as usual adhering to mm -hmm. many guidelines and respiratory etiquette so that's the like um, current situation in the education uh, side. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was uh, very enlightening. And in fact, I, I always say that uh, post-COVID is going to be very, very interesting, like you mentioned. The, the more we learn, if it's going to come down to things like dress code and, you know, maybe even we'll have to get out of our uh, way of thinking of just having, you know, one uh, timing, and uh, maybe have your batches split up. You'll have to think of multiple uh, smaller groups because uh, we can't do without practical training. We can't do without uh, hands-on training. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll move to Dr. Walid Kamal now. Uh, so what is the experience that you all are having? You, you've heard the other panelists speak. Uh, what has been your experience and the views that are happening in your country and among your faculty? regarding these same issues, because I think the, the overall issues are the same, the overall challenges are the same. Uh, what approach have you all uh, taken up or looking for the future, please? Thank you, my prof, uh, Derek, thank you. Thank you, my prof, Derek. Uh, by last, uh, of, uh, last March, 2020, the government recommended uh, universities 
too close uh, to control COVID infection. Uh, also, um, uh, recommended work around the world need and the commitment to home that affect social and behavioral development. Uh, so we conducted the e-learning through Blackboard or other software like Microsoft Teams and Zoom, or electronic masters through emails or WhatsApp for our students. These for theoretical courses, but for practical or clinical courses in the outpatient clinic uh, or, uh, or the hospitals, the students were classified to uh, small sections. Uh, but with adherence to guidelines of COVID uh, preventive, uh, COVID prevention, uh, like uh, infrared thermometer, a check temperature by infrared thermometer, uh, wearing masks and gloves, also sensitizers uh, were available for all grades during exams, uh, ex examination, final examination carried out online through Blackboard uh, or submitting researches. We, uh, asked our students to submit research to can evaluate them during this period as a pandemic period. While the graduation patch were examined written, but also with adherence to the guidelines of COVID prevention, like spaces between students. But we faced some challenges in this period. Some students were not trained before for Blackboard or electronic educations. Also, some faculties faced many problems during electronic teaching. Also, uh, the internet was not regularly connected. So in our uh, futures, we have to train uh, uh, or prepare workshops for our students to train also, also for physiotherapists, uh, faculties, mm -hmm. and the rehabilitation providers for uh, how uh, uh, can teach our students using Blackboard or electronic education. Also, yeah. uh, we have to solve these problems in, in the future. That is Isabel. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Waled. Yes, um, you. I think a couple of you have mentioned about the challenges of uh, technology. And of course, our students are much uh, quicker to adapt to the technology. But a major issue has been uh, the practical uh, issues, which I think must be true for you as well, where the people cannot afford maybe a laptop or uh, the connectivity is not good, especially those who are in an interior or far off uh, from the city. So those are issues that I think will keep coming up and we will have to address them as as we learn. So, yes. so those. Yes, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, when this recommendation by compulsory recommendation of commitment at home, uh, but yes. in last of April, physiotherapy outpatient to the guidelines of COVID prevention, such as yes. decreased number of visits, or also mm -hmm. and decrease the number of physiotherapists. Also disinfection and sterilization periodically for the, the uh, outpatient plan. Reducing also right. the working time for the outpatient clinics, but inpatient mm -hmm. physiotherapy uh, didn't change, uh, but the duties were increased in that period. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, prepared some printed instructions which are given to the patients according to their conditions. For our students, uh, we send uh, videos uh, for, uh, for practical uh, education, and also, uh, we uh, talk with them on what's or uh, direct connection uh, sometimes. Right. But internet, internet always, always feel problems. True, very true. So yes. that that is a reality. That is a reality. And I think data, data and connectivity is going to be the new uh, standard that people are going to. Uh, look for when when they uh, discuss these issues in in future. Uh, we are about uh, halfway uh, through this uh, webinar, and so I'll just request uh, all the panelists in case you have any helpful uh, resources, you can kindly share them in the chat box. I know uh, Professor Stevens has done, and uh, Dr. Vishnu has uploaded uh, those for us as well. So uh, you can always share some interesting reading or maybe some links that you can put into the chat box. And uh, all those who are listening into this can pick it up from there. 
and uh, i know a lot of the panelists are not really involved all the time so you can also go through the questions in the chat box and please feel free to uh, put in your comments or you can answer the questions there so that you know the discussion is happening on on two levels because i don't really want to interrupt uh, the speakers or their train of thought so if you find that uh, you can add to the discussion that is currently on or maybe there is something more that uh, you would like to add or maybe it's a random question that you read in the chat box please feel free to answer that as uh, well because uh, a lot of the students are here uh, over 450 of them in fact so i'm sure they'll pick up from what you have put into the chat box and uh, it will be much more uh, valuable to them so thank you panelists for uh, that as well i'll move to dr naomi uh, now and uh, ma'am what has been your experience again uh, the place where you are, uh, challenges of data, challenges of the students, uh, uh, getting them to attend classes, um, considering the needs of the patients at the same time trying to adhere to the government guidelines. Uh, how are you facing these challenges I, of the physiotherapist? I think that, Mary, if you could also tell your, 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 your country and the institution you are with, right? That will be good for everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Uh, I would want to report on the institution that I work for. Uh, I work for Moy University uh, School of Medicine, uh, which is in Eldoret. It's not in Nairobi, it's in Eldoret. Um, there are several challenges that we've faced. First of all, when the government uh, closed all the institutions, and that included institutions of higher learning, uh, our students had to go home. So since March 20th, 2020, our students have not been learning. Uh, both uh, the lower classes, that is the, the first year and second year, have been at home. Yeah. And the clinical years, that is third year and fourth year, they've equally been at home. At first, we had thought uh, we might uh, start online learning, but it was quite a challenge. And uh, I can't emphasize more on internet connectivity and smart gadgets, uh, where we realized that not all students had uh, smart, smart technology, as well as connectivity. So, so our students all along have not been learning. But uh, at the moment, the Kenyan government has uh, instructed uh, the universities and especially the schools of medicine, uh, where physiotherapy is part of the programs, and uh, as, as well as uh, the health colleges to start first reopening of the universities. And that is from 21st of September this year. So, so they, have, uh, they have to adhere to strict guidelines that are recommended by the Ministry of Health. Now the universities uh, have to resume learning following the strict guidelines and they have to conform to the physical and social distancing. Uh, and that especially applies uh, when it comes to halls of residence where students stay, uh, lecture rooms and dining halls. Uh, so, so this, the, the university have to make sure that all these places can conform to social distancing. Now, uh, to add on to that, we have this uh, reopening of the face-to-face -face session. And this is mostly because uh, at the moment as we open, we are looking at the final years. That is uh, for, for physiotherapy, the fourth years, which are the clinical years. Uh, because they, by the time we closed universities, they were going through their clinical rotations. So, so yes. this is not something they can stick in class and learn. They had to go through the clinical rotation. But uh, the advantage about uh, our students is we do not have huge numbers. So, so our fourth years are small numbers. And therefore, in every clinical rotation, we are likely to have three, two, or at most four students together with the supervisor. Okay. So, so as we open, we will ensure that uh, the students, number one, they're less in numbers, which that is not a problem for us. They have right. the PPEs, 
Uh, and uh, as, as we open, the institutions are very clear that the students has to ensure that they get their own PPEs or the scrubs for themselves. So the institutions are not providing their, uh, the PPEs for the students, as well as the lecturers. So we have to make sure that we get our own PPEs, the scrubs that facilitate our teaching and the student learning in their clinical rotation. Now, uh, the institution, on the other hand, has a requirement from the government. They have to ensure that they conform to providing water and soap for sanitization or hand sanitizers. And uh, as, as the students get into their clinical rotations, they have to be screened on a daily basis. And this includes, while well, taking the temperature, they have to answer a few questions whether they had traveled to a place where uh, COVID has been reported. Uh, they have had contact with patients who has COVID. Uh, so so uh, such are the things that uh, the students will be going on. So we have, so we have a, a protocol that we are following both for the student what they need to fulfill before they come back, as well as the institution. So, so as for the institution, uh, that does not cover a, a kind of a blanket. So the Ministry of Health is uh, kind of assessing every single institution to make sure that uh, they have conformed to the guideline based on which they will be allowed to open. Right. So, so, right. so that, those are some of the things that we are going through, but learning has not been taking place all along. Mm -hmm. Now, no, uh, I yes. something I yes, wanted to add, something I wanted to add is uh, for postgraduate, uh, we do not, at the Moy University, we do not have a postgraduate program. So we were not, uh, we, we were not uh, working uh, during COVID time. But uh, there are other programs that had postgraduate. So for the other programs that had postgraduate, learning was going on. So, but right. for physiotherapy, learning was not going on. Yes, that that is a serious uh, challenge, and I think all of us who uh, consider ourselves in the field of healthcare education have to really look at this, and uh, it is going to be an issue because. Tomorrow, unfortunately, these batches are going to have a stigma on them uh, of uh, not really being, uh, you know, possibly trained or uh, someone is going to ask. We, we were just joking about it. I know that, you know, you are in a COVID, COVID batch. So, uh, you know, how, how good are your skills and how good uh, was the training that you received? I think we'll, it's going to be another issue that we'll have to uh, look ahead in the years to come and and take some uh, corrective action. Uh, let me come to Dr. Maria now. I think you you have two major issues. One is because of the huge numbers, not only of uh, COVID per se. I think you must be having the same problem of huge number of staff being indisposed uh, because as as we've seen here in Pune as well this. It's getting closer and closer. We have uh, doctors, staff, physiotherapists who are either in quarantine or maybe tested positive, may not need hospital admission, but they are out of your system. So that is one issue. And uh, secondly, about uh, the uh, practical problems of conducting uh, digital classes, attendance, how do you ensure that the students are attending, uh, maybe a little bit of assessment? What are the issues that uh, you are facing because you are one of the premier institutes in the country and at the center of this uh, pandemic, may I say. So what has been your experience in the last few weeks at least? So as far as we are concerned, in one way we are lucky because mm -hmm. from March is the time our internal assessment starts. And right. our university exams, they start sometime in June. So we have May and June as theory exams, which are university. July and towards right. that end of July is the practical exams of university. And this, this is followed for all the mm -hmm. batches. And it's almost all over the country is following something like a similar pattern, which goes there. So when we were in lockdown in March, the exams were the only thing that was pending. 
the students were done with their clinical right. rotations as per their years their practicals and everything were done and they were to start appearing for the exams for internal assessments with the lockdown they all got oh. to go home because we had not anticipated so much lot of them left home without their books so their books were in the hostel yeah yeah lot of them stayed in the rural interiors where it is not possible for them to travel to commute and they had just left because their parents were panicked the yeah. hostel and everything food supply was not there so they had all gone almost home without books and the only yeah. resource now they were left was whatever is online resource available yeah. or whatever we could send them as pdfs that was there mm. the major and i think even data was an issue that that was a problem yeah. some of our students reported yeah. they said we don't have uh, connectivity we yes. don't have basic yeah. connectivity how do we attend your classes yeah. yeah that was a major issue of uh, connectivity internet was a big major issue yeah. the second yeah. issue is smartphones as you said sir A lot of people have said use of smartphones, laptops. Not everybody has laptops. Not everybody. Very true. Very true. Work from home was issued, so maybe one laptop if they had at the home to be shared between the parent, to be shared yeah. with the sibling, and to be shared with the student. Very Plus true. Plus the true. home environment. Absolutely. Home environment means there is always somebody around. Hmm. there is a lot of disturbance that the students said that because somebody was looking at what are you doing are you attending or not <laughs> are you sleeping True. so True. lot yeah. of environmental issues we thought home is very safe and they can concentrate and listen but uh, that that's not the thing lot of disturbances they had and yeah. taking online exams all of a sudden for teachers and students both hmm. so far not all teachers are trained into going online Yeah. Not all universities or all colleges have learning management with them. Systems, yeah. Suddenly introducing something new. Students have not appeared for online exam any time. Yes. Yeah. So we had to actually think how we could retort so that they can appear. And yeah. at our institute, at least what we use is WhatsApp as a social medium that is there. We use mm. WhatsApps for taking exams and everything. So we had papers okay. ready. so we uh, uploaded nice. the papers on the whatsapp the time table everything was given to them guidelines were given to them okay they wrote the answers and they started uploading but with the internet issues you know even those pdfs used to get queued and everything cool. clinical subjects faculty were very busy with the covid work hmm. over half the faculty was in covid work we had divided yeah. them into covid non covid academics so almost yeah. everybody was busy but everybody was very nice all over the country when i'm asking people have gone out of their way to go ahead and do corrections to attend to students queries and everything so the online process went on smooth for internal assessments and yeah. we could do them. and then comes that now final university exams which were supposed to mm -hmm. be scheduled yeah. so we have councils in certain states sir but Yeah. Very sadly, we still don't have a national council of physiotherapy in India. And if UNESCO in some way can help us, there is going to be a national commission bill that is going to be tabled soon this week in the parliamentary meeting. And we yeah. hope and look forward to get a council because then we would have broad guidelines for practice, for evaluations, for assessment, for uniformity, and everything. so wherever yeah. we have councils like maharashtra has a state council the council came forward with guidelines and everything provided yeah. to the universities and the university is making for now so now we'll be in yeah. maharashtra ensuring with the university exams of final years gujarat has finished their final year exams yeah. karnataka okay. is thinking of options so universities are considering whether to promote students without exam or take exams Yeah. but our universities have taken stand that no exams have to be taken and then only go in for promotion how are certain you know state universities like gujarat and all first year second year third year they have granted promotion on certain criteria and certain yeah. you know uh, skilling effects mm. that were given to it and fourth years everybody has taken exams so we'll be beginning right. with the fourth year that is a major clinical year for exams but looking at the scenario it's been like going into case based 
So yeah. from real patients, we may be shifting to case-based exams, simulated sure. cases, and then yeah. go ahead with take following all the safety norms, all the distancing and everything. Some states have gone in for Zoom exams with the PGs. So they took yeah. exams yeah. on Zoom yeah. and they have no, done the, PG, right. the PG yeah. exams yeah. and everything they have conducted there. Some of yeah. the areas like our places and all, we have taken real patients with all precautions and guidelines followed and we have conducted yeah. the exams over there for postgraduate students. We are still awaiting yeah. guidelines for taking final year exams at Maharashtra, which will be very yeah. soon in a day or two uploaded because exam dates and everything has been declared. So it will declared. come on very soon. Yeah. And we'll be going to, through the whole process in that particular manner. So the university and the state councils, wherever present, have all come together to you know, formulate and help us with how to proceed, how to take ahead and go. Students themselves are also very innovative. They are more tech savvy than we are. And you know they schedule the meetings very fast. The stand yeah. that one good thing that the university has taken is that they are second, the ongoing academic year, because there was a lot of concern, what will happen to their academic year if exams are not being held? Yeah, so they have yeah, allowed the student to go inside the new academic year true, and true, take yeah. the exams as they are there. So we don't lose on their timings because that's a concern yeah. with parents, students, everyone. So we have started with online lectures. So it's more of digital lectures. We're yeah. losing on the clinical part of it. So that's yeah, not there. And the teamwork, collaboration, the work environment is something that you're losing on. I but know, hopefully things will come out well. So from teaching, that's what you. we are looking for. Okay. Thank yeah, you, ma'am. Can I ask you, Dr. Maria, or Professor yes, Maria, uh, you're, you're, you're with the COVID ward, isn't that? You have a, your hospital, it's a COVID center. Yes, sir. Is it yes, right? sir. I that uh, um, Santosh is there with you. I just wanted to ask you, because I was listening today, you have, uh, what is the experience about your uh, your health workers getting infected? What is that where you, have you, because I just, I was just listening that um, the uh, COVID, the, the um, health care workers getting infected, it appears that in India, it's nine times higher than what has happened in the average for the rest of the world. Yesterday it was there. So I just wanted to ask your opinion, uh, given that you are um, that you are in a COVID hospital, and I know that you work on the uh, the COVID ward there. What have you all had much infection of the, of the staff of the healthcare workforce? So where the, the healthcare workers are working inside the COVID ward with full PPE and everything, the chances of infection are too minimal. Whatever infections we have seen are away from the COVID world. That is when they are, you know, with the others. So, so that's where, the time. Where, where so you are, you are saying it's uh, not in the world. So where not do they the get world. infected? Not so in where the is world. that? So where are they getting infected? Where? In in the when when the, so yes sir. So when in the non-COVID world, if you are not wearing proper mask and you are not taking proper precautions. That's the time when people are getting infected. Second is when they're sitting together and eating. That's a very common uh, attitude of people because we are used to being together. Being together. And somehow very this is coming in the way when, because all the masks are down that time. And if there's somebody who's an asymptomatic carrier, because we are not testing carrier, everyone. We are not screening everyone. So at, that is the point where the breach is occurring and people are getting transmitted and infected. Yes, no, you're absolutely right, ma'am. Dr. Russell, uh, we've seen it happen in almost all the, not only our college, but even other hospitals as well. Uh, on the COVID ward, those who are directly dealing with COVID patients in the casualty, because the, uh, call it awareness, call it the use of uh, PPE, everything put together, the chances of uh, infection or the um, infection that we're actually seeing is very, very less. But unfortunately, it's, in the other wards, it's uh, through the canteen, it's even in families, it's people who, you know, just said, no, there was some celebration and we went and attended, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's where they've, they've come out uh, so, with a positive uh, test. So it just goes to underline how careful we need to be, you know, not just on the COVID ward, not just with someone who is positive. 
but I, I was, uh, take a precaution from everyone. I was just uh, interested in knowing this because uh, it is very high in India. I think over 500 doctors alone have. Yesterday, I was at the meeting uh, with Kek Agarwal, the IMA, and they were talking about it. And today, I heard it's nine times higher. So whichever way it is, something somewhere it's happening. So, so the problem problem comes in private areas, sir. Mm -hmm. The private practitioners and the private places where they don't get the PPEs, PPE, and they are mostly yes, treating yes. all the inpatients, you know, the walk-in patients and things. Yeah. That is why tele rehab almost the whole private practitioners have switched over to tele rehabilitation. Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. are doing tele rehabilitation much more because one is survival, the other is service that has to be ongoing. And the third is fear of contracting the disease because we cannot have so much supply of resources of the PPE everywhere, maintenance, sanitization of the clinics and everything. So the private practitioners are the ones who have gone more into tele-rehabilitation to safeguard. And where these breaches are occurring in the private practice, we are seeing a lot of infections then dropping up, coming in. Yeah. So Thank now tele-rehab tele is going up. I don't know, Tanya, whether there's in Australia, are you using tele, a lot of tele rehab to Tanya? Are you using tele rehab? You're doing rehab. We, we have rehab wards, so patients from the acute hospital are still going to our rehab centres. They are considered, um, our rehab centre is considered a clean centre, so we screen everyone uh, before they come. So whilst they've been an inpatient, they usually have a COVID test make sure that they're negative before they get transferred to our rehabilitation ward. Um, from the rehabilitation ward, when they move back home and into the community, certainly our community physiotherapists are using telehealth uh, for the majority of the patients. It's only the high risk patients who are at high risk of representing back to hospital who are having face-to-face -face consultations. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, uh, Dr. South, we haven't forgotten you. Thank you for being patient. I know someone has to uh, be at the end to to finalize us. So I'm I'm coming to you, and I'm glad yes, that uh, you are here. Thank you also. for your no. I know that. I I was just uh, checking whether he is there because his camera was off. Uh, so we'll just make a quick call test uh, Canada before we we join uh, Dr. South for for his comments. So, uh, Dr. Perumal, you've heard a lot of the discussion that has happened. Uh, what is the overall view in Canada and what inputs can you give us which uh, possibly we can learn from or some guidelines that you have picked up and uh, uh, where, where uh, the whole practice of uh, physiotherapy, especially for the future, is headed? Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Russell, Dr. Dredak, and Dr. Mary, Dr. Neela Misra, as well as uh, Dr. Pushnu Devi for the opportunity given to me. Um, and I also thank my fellow speakers, uh, as well as the participants all over the world attending this webinar. Um, it's uh, good morning from Canada, right at the time, like it's uh, seven o'clock in Edmonton. Uh, as I mentioned last time, I work in a hospital setting as well as the private practice, uh, mostly. In uh, Canada, uh, of course, uh, we had a lockdown from March 27th to May uh, 4th. Um, some of the employers even extended uh, until May 12th or even May th uh, third week of May, of course. So uh, before the... During the lockdown period, uh, the physiotherapist who worked in uh, hospital settings, uh, uh, nursing homes, as well as the rehab hospitals were continued to be part of working, of course. They had no problems, but uh, um, as per the government of uh, Canada, as well as the provincial government, the private practice should be completely closed. Um, so those physios who worked in private practice were actually uh, staying at home and being part of uh, mitigating uh, spread of infection, of course. Um, so let me uh, talk about uh, first the hospital uh, settings, of course. So the physiotherapist who worked in uh, hospital settings, 
um, uh, did prepare for uh, uh, COVID uh, patients, of course. Uh, the hospital management actually prepared, uh, uh, vacated a couple of units uh, in each floor um, so that the COVID-19 patients will get admitted. Um, in each unit in our hospital, we could admit about 20 patients. Um, so there were proper education before uh, uh, we, we got, uh, you know, sudden increase in COVID-19 patients. But fortunately, fortunately, we did not have to um, uh, keep the uh, units vacated because uh, because of the lots of cooperation from the people, um, there were less uh, people as far as the COVID positive patients concerned, of course. Um, the physios uh, uh, who work at the hospitals do have sick time as well as the vacation time. So when they become symptomatic, they were uh, supposed to isolate. It is the regulatory body, uh, as per the regulatory body, each physiotherapy as well as the uh, every Canadian citizen should isolate themselves uh, in order to mitigate the spread of infection. Um, those who violate the, uh, the order will be heavily fined. This is one of the main things in Canada. The sore throat, and they will call the employer, and they are supposed to stay at home. They they have to call the health link, and the health link will guide the physios um, to uh, go for the test or not. Uh, initially, uh, there there were a screening tool was was prepared by uh, Alberta Health Services as well as each province. So whenever the people uh, like the healthcare provider had some queries they can go through that self-assessment uh, questionnaires and that will guide whether uh, that particular individual will go to the uh, test or not. Um, so the situation changed whenever uh, anyone got uh, symptomatic, they were automatically called for COVID uh, uh, test, of course. Um, so if the physios uh, become positive, for example, and they have to be quarantined and it's completely paid by the employer. That was the situation, that was the situation in the hospital. So hmm. the, those physios working in the hospital and nursing homes did not face any income reduction, of course, that were completely protected. Right. But the, most of the physios who work in private settings were self-employed, that means you see the patients and you get money, right? So when they were forced to be um, the, the only uh, source of income for them is uh, through tele rehab, okay? Plus yeah. the Canadian support. The Canada, uh, the government of Canada as well as the other governments have very good uh, efforts took very good efforts to support those people who were not working. So yeah. during lockdown period, uh, um, um, the physios were staying at home. They were conducting daily rehab. Uh, of course, as I mentioned last time, when you use the and confidentiality should be maintained. Uh, we had few challenges with the tele rehab, especially with the uh, being physios. You know, it's a it's a physiotherapy is a touch profession. You should feel what's happening with the patient, right? So, with the assessment, we had difficulties, uh, especially with the objective part of the assessment. We can check the range of motion, but how to check the strength, um, especially if the patients are uh, living alone at home. Uh, so there were a few challenges, and especially if the patients, uh, it's also physiotherapist's responsibility to maintain the safety of the patient. Let's say if the patient is living alone, and when I am assessing the patient, if something happens to the patient, I am the one responsible to call uh, emergency health services um, so yeah. that the patient will be safe. So there were quite a bit of uh, some challenges, of course, during that tele-rehab uh, program. Um, uh, the, the, we were allowed to uh, do uh, urgent care physiotherapy on site during the lockdown period, as in Australia and England. 
uh, it is a responsibility of the physiotherapist to determine whether the patient falls into urgent care or not. Uh, there were two important guidelines from the regulatory body. The first one is uh, any healthcare professionals are injured or if their old injury is flared up, they will automatically fall into urgent care because they need the physiotherapy so that they can get back onto the track to help the other people, okay? Then the other um, category guideline by the regulatory body is those patients uh, do not get physiotherapy will end up in hospital emergency as like in Australia. So we don't want, we don't want the patients uh, keep coming to the uh, emergency so that the hospital beds will be filled and exactly. won't be available for the appropriate patients. Yeah. So those patients will be identified. Let's say like if somebody got a hip replacement done and if they are yeah. uh, discharged home, it's uh, community physiotherapy should continue the physiotherapy so, so that the patient right. will continue maintaining the range of motion and strength so that they mm -hmm. will be having responsibility of the physiotherapist to find out the urgent care. And when we visit our clinic for the on-site care, we need to follow our own guidelines. It's very important as a physiotherapist, you stop spreading the infection. So the, as per the, uh, uh, the governing body and government of Canada, as well as the employer's guidelines, we need to thoroughly screen the patient over the phone first, then at the time of the uh, uh, arrival, then, one, when they enter, we need to screen the patient. For, and it's very important to maintain our safety of the environment. And as I mentioned last time, we had to reconfigure our clinical space to maintain the physical distancing. And yeah. of course, the guidelines also, we need to use like uh, 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 um, hand sanitizers or any... Um, sanitizing uh, agents which should have drug identification number. So there were a few mm -hmm. guidelines. And if you are going to attend physiotherapy, it's mandatory, you need to put the mask, okay? Yeah. And the patients will also be encouraged to put the mask, okay? So this is the, this is the setting in case of like physiotherapist in Canada. Um, as far as the education side is concerned, our physiotherapy students are basically master of physiotherapy students. There is no right. bachelor of physiotherapy here, okay? Okay. That, that means students who do have lots of background, maybe bachelor of science or bachelor of kinesiology, you know, whatever. Master of physiotherapy, which is about two years and 10 months. Uh, most of the things uh, before COVID is on-site learning as well as the uh, placement. Okay? They do have quite a number of placements. They do have, I think, five to six uh, placements and each is about, for about six weeks placement. So yeah. what happened is like during lockdown time, um, everything became online and uh, the, the uh, University of Alberta professors had a hard time to find the instructors at the private settings because all the private sectors were closed. Um, so that forced uh, the hospital physiotherapist to take more students uh, in order to complete the placement. Yes. Um, uh, um, then the exams were canceled. In Canada, once you complete the two, uh, two years and 10 months course, uh, you need to appear for a written examination, which is There are only two practical exams in one year. So the students have to pass both the written examination as well as practicum. But those who completed written examination can also practice under the supervision, okay? So right. they, the, both students, like, they had a hard time to complete the degree, okay? Mm -hmm. And right. that, that, that was challenges for them, of course. Then um, the other thing is that because we do have more uh, international students coming to our Canada, 
and because the practice of healthcare system in canada as well as the other part of the world are totally different uh, the international students do need some support from the canadian universities so the canadian right. universities developed a international bridging program for the international students mm -hmm. So those students who are interested to join an international uh, bridging program also uh, model of education. So they were completely lacking hands-on experience. So they, they were completely lacking uh, learning from peer groups. It's, it's like when you're learning, it's very important how practically you are improving because our practicum is very, I like the practicum, but it's very difficult to do, okay? Very difficult. So you need more hands-on skills in order to get the exams passed and in order to get settled here, okay? Oh. So that's, that's the part of the education. And as far as the government support is concerned, we had reasonably like very good supports from the government. Um, during lockdown period, Canada uh, government um, uh, supported uh, like financially, uh, for example, uh, being self-employed, if the physiotherapist had to sit at the home, they were given $2,000 per month. For four weeks, they were given $2,000. Uh, it's a fantastic support, but as compared to their regular earning, that is very small amount, of course. That's very small, and uh, uh, there are other supports like you. There, there were mortgage uh, deferral programs, so you don't have to pay uh, our house mortgage or uh, clinic uh, mortgage. So that was exempted for six months. Plus, uh, most of the physiotherapists are owners of the physiotherapy clinics. So right. uh, the government, the government supported uh, fifty percentage of the rent. Um, uh, to that each clinic. The rental, of course, is very high. When the clinic is closed, there is no income. So you no need income. support yeah. from the government, yeah. right? Then the uh, business owners, were, the companies were also given $40,000 on a loan basis. Uh, if the business owner is able to pay that amount uh, within December 2020, then $10,000 will be forgiven. So that support was huge support. Um, the, right. the only problem we had is uh, 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 the physiotherapy should have zero income um, during that particular period, whatever the period they are getting. So that is the only thing because we were, we were doing tele recap uh, that gives some money, of course, money, yeah, uh, yeah. but, but uh, by, by getting a little bit of money through tele rehab, we were not be eligible to uh, Canadian government financial support. So our regulatory body, as well as the Canadian Physiotherapy Association, um, uh, negotiated the government. So they came to conclusion that the physiotherapist can earn about $1,000 those who are, got, uh, are earning up to $1,000 will be eligible to get $2,000. So they were actually getting like $3,000, which was like great support from yeah, uh, the yeah. end, of course. And the students, students also here in Canada, students do work as well as study, right? Uh, yeah. So they yeah. basically part-time. So uh, Canada, Canadian government also supported the students so those students who worked in 2019 or 20 and who were able to um, uh, earn for about $5,000 will be eligible to get, uh, I think $1,250 for four weeks period from the government. So that was like added benefit for them. Plus the Canadian government also supported the uh, scholarship for the student. They extended the grant for the research students and postgraduate students. Um, then uh, for the public, the, the Canadian government also invented a COVID alert app, which you can download in your phone. And that, uh, that app um, has uh, connected with the other phone through Bluetooth provided yeah. privacy and confidentiality is maintained and Maintain. that shares the codes 
that will alert you if anybody who were positive in 14 days or if they are if you are exposed yeah. to yeah. anyone you know so those kind of those, those kind of supports uh, was really encouraging and uh, fit for work alberta health services uh, every it's everybody's responsibility before going to the work you have to do fit for work and you have to show the admin that you are ready to work okay Excellent. so there were quite bit of That's all from me. Thank you, Dr. Perumal, mm -hmm. for that. And in fact, I think it's uh, quite encouraging. And I think a lot of our physiotherapy students will be heading to Canada after after the restriction opens up. If if the government is going to be that benevolent. I see Dr. John Stevens giving me a very messy. I think he's going to be recommending some of his students move to Canada. No, uh, it's it's true. The the healthcare workers all over the world. I'm I'm glad to hear uh, share that even a uh, lot of the nursing professionals, doctors were given some uh, support, and I think we need uh, that. And I'm sure this will be a good uh, focus for the future. Uh, Dr. South, thank you for being so very patient and for waiting with us uh, right to the end. Uh, I know Saudi Arabia because we had a couple of uh, nursing and healthcare professionals who also uh, came. Just a minute. Let me unmute you. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, I know the Saudi Arabian government has been very helpful in this regard because some of our nursing colleagues were telling us about uh, the support that they received. Uh, has it been the same for physiotherapy and uh, what is the outlook for Saudi Arabia and how are you tackling your problems? Dr. South, please. Okay, thank you for uh, having me. Um, actually, um, in regards of the governmental uh, support, um, yes, that was um, true. Uh, for those who um, asked to uh, stay home and those who work for the government, they were receiving their um, monthly salary, um, um, like uh, the whole the whole amount. And those who work for the private in the private sector were uh, financially uh, supported, and they were giving um, uh, part of their uh, salary was paid by uh, the government. And uh, in the educational, uh, in the education field, uh, also the one of the supports that the student uh, got, the Communication and Information Commission has made the internet available for uh, affordable price for uh, students uh, to use for educational uh, purposes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, also- What about the other practical issues that physiotherapists are are facing, or what are the challenges that they have ahead? So, in the um, educational uh, in the education field, um, yeah. actually, the local authorities have taken some early uh, actions to to uh, prevent or limit the spread of the virus, and I think they uh, did a a great job in that. Uh, one of the action has been taken by Ministry of Education to um, switch the education from uh, in-person education to remote or uh, an online education. Right. Uh, use a different kind of uh, platform. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily, in our university, we have uh, we already have a, a platform. A platform. Uh, as the other one of the challenges that we or some of the faculty members faced is um, they have they don't have enough experience to deal with the platform. I think our university have done a great job in delivering and making some workshops on how to deal with the platform. Uh, personally, I have enjoyed uh, teaching through uh, platform, especially delivering the theoretical part and the 
theorems and exams. Um, however, I wasn't um, happy with uh, teaching the practical uh, part. You know, uh, the practical part, you need um, hand-on uh, method of uh, teaching. Um, so in, in this uh, new academic year, and upon reviewing the, the data fra, uh, released from the health uh, Ministry of Health, and especially with the numbers uh, going down, the Ministry of Education have um, decided to make the practical part um, in Canvas with taking all the yeah, yeah. Um, actions like the social distance and wearing the protective equipment. However, in, in uh, hospitals early in the um, early in the pandemic, um, the outpatient clinics had been closed and um, out have been uh, minimized for uh, the best. They have been asked to work in uh, uh, mainly in the inpatient clinics. Um, not working, not working with uh, those who have a corona uh, virus. But uh, recently, after the numbers uh, got down, uh, the outpatient uh, clinics has uh, opened, uh, but with keeping the number of patients very, very low. Uh, physiotherapists have used uh, the tele-rehabilitation. Uh, tele tele-rehab, yes. Um, mainly to follow up with the patients, with the previous patients, um, th those who have been diagnosed and have been giving uh, uh, in an intervention program. So the therapists were uh, contacting uh, patients and um, uh, uh, evaluating their uh, progression and uh, modifying their uh, exercise uh, programs but it wasn't used uh, with uh, new patients because it is very hard to do uh, the assessment part. You need to see the patient, you need uh, hand on. So uh, it wasn't used with uh, new patients until right. recently the outpatient uh, clinic um, have opened. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saudza. That was uh, really informative and uh... In fact, I think today we've come out with a lot of uh, practical uh, solutions and a deeper understanding of uh, the problems being faced by physiotherapists worldwide. And uh, like Dr. Russell always says, there's a lot of solidarity. There's a lot of understanding that the problems we are facing are the same. And uh, yes, there are challenges. There are challenges of uh, technology while it's been pretty useful. Uh, we have to look at ways and means how we can use this uh, technology going forward. Like uh, someone mentioned, you can uh, watch uh, someone uh, doing range of motion, but uh, how do you assess power? And uh, I'm quite confident because uh, my own experience has been that uh, our physiotherapy faculty as well as our students are very, very innovative. The, the only danger or the only uh, challenge is to put it to them as a challenge and say, how are you going to do this in, in future? And I'm sure they'll come up with some uh, standardized uh, measures that can be done in a home setting to test power. It may not very, be very accurate, but to some extent, maybe it can gauge uh, problems like that. I'm just thinking aloud on this uh, forum. I know there are a lot of uh, more experienced people here, but these are maybe ideas that we can develop. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, time. It's, it's challenging for all of us. Uh, again, I'm glad uh, Dr. Maria brought out this issue of there being no national forum as such. But uh, today we have uh, Professor Neela Mishra, who's the vice uh, chancellor with us, and she's head of the Allied Health Program of the UNESCO in India. And I'm sure Madam will uh, take this up with uh, Professor Poo Vishnu. And uh, I'll tie up with Dr. Poo Vishnu and maybe we'll have something like a Google ID created uh, to start with so that there is a central point of contact for all the physiotherapists who have been on this program. 
so uh, to all the participants and students uh, possibly within the next uh, week or 10 days we'll try and get you uh, id email id at least maybe you can start by uh, posting your problems there or we'll see if we can uh, have some other centralized forum where we can all uh, get together and uh, take this uh, forward um, once uh, we have a national forum i know there'll be a lot of issues that can be very easily taken up and uh, if we look at the positive effects of covid like i keep saying maybe this is something that uh, goes well uh, for the future so uh, dr puvishnu if you would like to say a few words and then i'll uh, hand it over to dr russell to conclude and thank our panelists for today Sir, thank you, Derek, sir. Sir, I saw some questions in the chat box, like what is happening in the teaching when what academicians are doing during this COVID time. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please go yes. ahead. I saw a question for me. Um, actually, suddenly the physiotherapist academician suddenly has to jump into all the innovative gadgets and work with that and teach, take lectures with that. Which is not at all used. used you, we were not used to that. So our lot of times we spend in uh, making the video sessions, voice over uh, for the PPTs and such things. But one innovative thing what we do is like uh, we are preparing proposals for the post-COVID physiotherapy things. Like example, we all know that in post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis and other uh, complications, belt palsy, which has huge, huge scope for physiotherapist in future. So we are preparing proposals to get grants from various uh, outsourcing agencies. So we are covering up like that. I think this is not the end. We have to grow up, grow up much with the research as activities on COVID also. Yeah. So thank you, sir. Uh, handing over to Dr. Russell. Thank you, uh, Vishnu and uh, Derek. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, Dr. Neen. Uh, look, uh, thank you all the, uh, to the panel. Uh, very, very interesting discussions we had. A couple of things I wanted to bring up here. One is um, Derek talked about uh, um, about getting you together, getting a um, forum, and so forth. I know last year or so there was the discussion about it came. Um, I mean, this is from this is with regards to India. I was there. At one of the meetings, and I think it was going before the Parliament uh, for uh, having a national uh, uh, to have a national board like like all the other um, uh, uh, what do you call it the other disciplines. But I think the COVID must have pushed all this in different directions. But I'm sure that will come. But on on another front. Um, I'm very keen to, uh, that we set up a global um, expert group of the physiotherapists in, the, in coming up with, with uh, some guidelines on the UNESCO, this is on the UNESCO platform on setting up uh, guidelines or thoughts on COVID on dealing with the ethical issues, managing the ethical issues with COVID. Now, why I say this is we have an excellent group that formed from this that now in the pharmacy um, discipline, they've got, they're having uh, a group uh, to uh, someone, uh, I will appoint someone, one of you to chair that or co co coordinate that. We've got an expert group um, a global ex expert group from nursing who have come up, uh, who have put together, and they they like this. They are now meeting and uh, and uh, having their own um, uh, thoughts about actual guidelines on you know. And this is very good because it brings a global picture from every part of the world, from the developed to the developing into all all continents, right? And we have the same with family therapy. We have all this that came from here. So I'm going to ask, and I will set up with all of you here, and maybe some, 
a few others which Vishnu will, 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 will bring in. Um, and the other issue is that we have, uh, I, I have uh, Professor uh, Des Tahil here from Melbourne. He's from Arama. He's, he's with us. He's from the Melbourne unit of the Minister Chair with Pian Lo, uh, Dr. Pian Lo. So he they, uh, puts a, a summary of these, uh, 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 and we usually have the recording of the whole program with this summary. It's on the web uh, for the BioIPCon web, we'll give it to you. So it's all the 24 will be there. Uh, it's all all the different. So you'll see dental. Uh, dental also, we've got a group they came together too. And so what we're going to do is we will have as a joint, all of you, all the panelists become the joint um, authors of a paper on the proceedings of this these two of the sessions discussing a global aspect of ethical issues faced with physiotherapists in the COVID, uh, in the wake of uh, mitigating or responding to the COVID pandemic, right? So I'll get one of well, someone here, well, we'll get uh, Maria or one uh, or some of you here, they will decide that. To coordinate this, we'll get this here, we'll send it around like all the others are done. So this will be published uh, in the uh, Global Biophysical Inquiry uh, Index Journal, International Journal of the UNESCO Chair, which goes to the whole world. So this will be an index. I think it will be a great opportunity. All the others are doing that. Is that right, Barry? The, yeah, the, yeah. the nurse, the yes, nurse. We, we have the other the papers in the pipeline. The <laughs> uh, and we, we, so we'll have this going through. And I think coming this together will be a great opportunity to continue to discuss and to come uh, to make this useful. All of you, you know, you've got uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ram who spoke about Canada. Uh, we, I think, I, I should ask Tanya. Uh, I think many of these things that we're having in Canada are similar in Australia. Is that right? Uh, in terms of the government support and so forth. Uh, I'm not sure about students, but uh, I don't know much about it. But from the public and from the others, uh, they all are also doing. So it looks like I'm sure Britain, the UK is doing similar stuff too, uh, in terms of um, so supporting the, you know, the main. main uh, but you'll still be a lot at a loss, isn't it? Uh, the whole pandemic is still affected, uh, affecting everyone. And, but I think what's important is that we come out with at the end of this and with a little more discussion, we will have some guidelines to be put published and actually be useful for others uh, because you, you represent these countries and on the UNESCO platform uh, where you bring this and publish it in the international. This is what this group came together and had to discussions and this was what came out of it right this is what we saw this is what's happening in in, in north america this is what's happening in uh, australia and europe uh, in, in asia and africa and then come together it will be it will be an important this is what the others have been doing and we have supported this and we act as the conduit i my i and I, I had the education department which is around uh, which, which expands to all the 58 countries in the world so it will be a great op opportunity for the physiotherapists so uh, probably if, if you didn't many people would not realize that uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the interaction and the, the contribution that physiotherapists are doing even not just in rehabilitation but even in active uh, uh, acute uh, um, uh, clinical work in COVID related. Uh, is that right? Am I right? From respiratory to. Yes, sir. Without a doubt. Without a doubt, sir. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a great, uh, this has been an opportunity to open up this the contribution that we are making um, in, in terms of um, uh, the COVID, um, mitigating the COVID. Um, pandemic effects on, uh, and so I'll, I'll once, uh, thank all of you and thank, we had a, we had 
nearly 500 um, on this. I don't know how many are there on the live. This is being live streamed on YouTube. Yeah. Already, already 360 members are there. Initially, there were 480 members. Yeah, no, I'm talking of the live streaming. On the YouTube. YouTube. On YouTube. the YouTube as well, there are. Yeah, because we've got it being live streamed on YouTube. So, well, there's about five to six hundred physio, mostly physiotherapists, I think, or others too, around the world who are taking part, who are complete. Um, I saw from Brazil, we've seen all the countries taking part that they were uh, on, on, the, on the chat. They've all um, uh, taken part here. So, this is a great opportunity to bring this together come out with something substantial, something concrete. And we offer that opportunity on the platform of the UNESCO chair um, and, and the International Index Journal of the UNESCO of Global Biophysical Inquiry, okay? So we'll, 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 we'll work towards that. So once, uh, so with all that now, let me take uh, this moment to thank the world, thank the very distinguished Panel here who contributed significantly and we really, deeply really appreciate it. I want to thank the conveners, uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, Neela Mishra, the Vice Chancellor, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, um, um, Krishna Devi, who is the Dean and the Head of um, Physiotherapy Ethics Bioethics Program, and, and then all the Participants, we had a lovely a number of participants from around the world. <coughs> Many of you got up at 5 30 in the morning. Some of you are there from 5 30 in the morning. Some of us here are 12 o'clock or nearly 12 in the night. Uh, we, uh, all of us in Australia. So we have this wonderful spread from 5 30 in the morning in Edmonton to uh, May to, you know, 9 to be start at 9 30 in the night in Melbourne. And all of us so in solidarity, we are in, we're so, demonstrating solidarity here in unison, working, discussing, supporting, appreciating what each and every one of, our, of us are doing, coming together with the pandemic that everyone together are facing the world, rich and poor.